Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Ma Matias Zaldariaga from Astrophysics Group IAS Princeton, who is going to present uh, a talk regarding challenges for physical cosmology after Planck. I'm not going to give a big introduction to the speaker because he's very well known to the cosmology community as well as whole physics community. But yeah, like for small uh, introduction, he was a professor before joining IAS. He was a professor at Harvard and uh, New York University. He got a lot of appreciations like MacArthur Fellowship and uh, Sloan Fellowship and so on. Uh, uh, Matthias, you can actually continue with your talk. And thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk for all of us. And uh, I hope it will be really great that you are uh, agreeing to give this kind of talk here. Great, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, as I was saying, I hope uh, you interrupt me, ask me questions uh, whenever you, you have one. It's difficult for me to uh, know what's going on with the audience in Zoom, it's not so easy. I also hope you are all doing good, uh, given the circumstances. I know it's not an easy time, but uh, we should try to make the best of it. So um, let's see. Let me share my screen. Is it is it working? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So um, so what I wanted to talk about today. So. Um, I wanted to give you some sort of summary of the state of uh, cosmology uh, now. Um, so now a few years back, the Planck satellite that measured the cosmic microwave background presented their last results. And I think this was a very, um, very uh, defining moment for, for the field, at least the part of the field who, where I am working mostly, which is, um, uh, trying to connect uh, the theory with the observations. Uh, we had been waiting for decades for, you know, the Planck data and so on. And okay, it finally happened. We learned what we had to learn. And now we are living in some sort of uh, lull of, uh, of data and information because the CMB was so powerful that many of the other probes that we are developing now, um, do so uh, so the, the the kind of uh, sociology of the field in which we had uh, the you know big changes in what we knew about things every couple of years it's a little bit slowed down and uh, and hopefully it will pick up in the near future but that i think for me at least when planck uh, gave their results it was um, it was uh, and partly because i've been in the field when planck was uh, you know a, a, a few a future dream was a big moment so i want to um, tell you a little bit about the status of things uh, at this point in time after, after this not to say that there are no more things going on and but i think um it was it was an important it was an important moment. So I, I believe not everybody here is a cosmologist. So I'll try to um, uh, I'll try to uh, first uh, go and give you some uh, basic. Um, um, so Matthias, uh, yeah, will you talk about mostly CMB, or you will talk about some other uh, results from Trunk as well? No, I will talk. Uh, I will I will move more uh, so I'll, I'll summarize uh, the CMB results quickly uh, but I want to talk about given what we have learned what are the are the questions for the future and uh, what are the things that need to be developed and and uh, that's that's the main goal but I first uh, well correct me if I'm wrong I, I assume most people might not have uh, yeah, true, true. We're all on the same page. I don't know. So I wanted to br give you some basic uh, facts uh, so that uh, at least the things that I'm going to discuss later uh, yeah, I mentioned. Yeah, great. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so um, so just uh, to orient ourselves, I will call. Uh, so you know, we all know about the Big Bang, the hot Big Bang model of our universe started expanding very fast and hot and cooling down, very dense. Uh, we've been we've uh, started figuring all of these out for a long time ago. The discovery of the expansion of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, which is the radiation left over from the time when the universe was very hot. So uh, the 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 nucleosynthesis of light elements, a lot of information uh, that has been accumulating for for hundred years or more uh, about about the universe we live in. Um, and for me, the hot Big Bang is, uh, or what I would call the hot Big Bang in, uh, in this uh, talk, is this history of the universe with various things that happen at different times as the, as the universe cools down and, and dilutes. Uh, but all from the, uh, since the, since the time it was already very hot uh, uh, and uh, started very hot and dense. Of course, something might have happened before this time, most, uh, and we believe perhaps a period of inflation happened before. And I wanted to separate the hot Big Bang part of the story, which has a lot of um, uh, experimental evidence uh, and, uh, and to the, the, what, what happened prior to this uh, part, which, you know, we have nice ideas and observations and so on, but it's less, uh, um, less um, constrained by by observations. Um, one of the so a, a different because the universe is expanding and diluting and cooling, different processes uh, happen at different times. For example, in the first uh, minute or so, the very light elements were synthesized: uh, helium and uh, deuterium, things like this. Uh, another very important time for us uh, in this talk will be the epoch when uh, the hydrogen atoms combine from being protons and electrons separate to be form hydrogen atoms. That's the time of recombination. It's very important the, uh, for the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, which uh, is left over from, from, it was the spectrum of the CMB was, was generated in the first year of the Big Bang or something like that. But uh, the universe was not transparent to the CMB photons because uh, there were a lot of free electrons. The cross section for interaction of light with electrons is very high. And so the CMB photons were bouncing around until this time when the universe becomes neutral, hydrogen atoms form 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We call this recombination. And then the cosmic microwave background photons can travel unimpeded pretty much. Um, in a straight line from wherever they were to us. And we've managed to, to make observations of that, which allows us to see how these regions of the universe were from where these photons are coming, how they were, how the matter was distributed, how it was moving, things like that, 380,000 years uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, so that's, in a sense, our earliest picture of regions of the universe. After that, uh, we take uh, pictures uh, mainly by looking at luminous matter, for example, galaxies um, or uh, quasars, which is uh, light, the, the accretion onto black holes uh, in centers of galaxies, for example. They're very bright objects. So we trace where matter is by looking at at least uh, the matter that emits uh, radiation, and we try to make maps of where the, the, how this matter is distributed and so on. So we have various pictures along the way. Um, but our earliest picture uh, of regions of the universe, uh, what, it comes from the cosmic microwave background. Um, so uh, to establish this entire hot Big Bang picture of the universe, there's two types of measurements that uh, have been done historically, and I want to distinguish a little bit uh, between them. So some of these um, measurements are about the homogeneous universe. So for the for the most part, the universe on large, sufficiently large scales is uh, homogeneous. Everywhere is more or less the same. That's, of course, there's a galaxy here. There's no galaxy over there. There's another galaxy here. So, but this happens on small, on small scales. Once you zoom out and say you take a very big regions of uh, 
tens of megaparsec on a side and you count galaxies inside them, they all look similar, the same number of galaxies in the different regions, the typical properties of the galaxies inside of each region is the same and so on. So, and as you make the, the regions bigger and bigger, the differences between one, one of these, uh, I don't know, cubes that you draw in the universe and some other cube, they are become smaller and smaller and smaller. So as you move out, as you zoom out and try to see on large scales, the universe looks more and more homogeneous. It's described by this uh, Friedman, Roberts and Walker uh, solution of general relativity. And we've measured a lot of properties of this homogeneous solution, like the expansion history, um, the abundances of different elements, the temperature of the microwave background, its spectrum. So these are all properties of the homogeneous universe. But as I was saying, if you go on sufficiently small scales, you see differences from place to place, galaxy here, no galaxy there, differences in the density, in the small differences, uh, and the difference get bigger as you go to small uh, uh, physical scale, small uh, um, scales. Um, and so for, for, for the last uh, few decades, a lot of the information in cosmology has come from trying to understand these departures from homogeneity, how different, the, how, how different the universe is in different places and across his, the history. So these differences uh, from place to place uh, change with time. In fact, they, the, today the universe is more inhomogeneous than it was in the past. When we look at the cosmic microwave background, we all only notice that the density of matter changed by very little from place to place, like 10 parts per, per million, something like that. Um, small velocities today, you know, there's much uh, bigger density contrast from one place to the other. And so structure develops in time, we figured out. Um, and the way it, uh, it uh, develops in time is very much dependent on, uh, okay, of course, for our universe, we have our observations, it did whatever it did. And, uh, but if we wanted to compute what we would expect, how we expect this structure to evolve in time in our universe, in a universe, it will very much depend on the, what the composition of the universe is. The dominant force that leads to the growth of structure is gravity. So the, uh, gra what we call gravitational instability. We have a little bit more matter in some location. There's more attractive force of gravity that uh, pulls more matter into that location. And, this, and, and so the, the, it becomes a runaway process. But you know, matter experiences other forces, uh, pressure forces, et cetera. And this depends on what the universe is made of. Dark matter doesn't have those things. Regular matter does. And dark, the, the, the cosmological constant is a homogeneous thing that doesn't, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's homogeneous everywhere. It doesn't cluster. So depend on what you make your universe of, how the structure grows. So what you should see when you make observations at different times is very different. And so this is how we have been able in the last decades to figure out um, what the universe is made of uh, with, great, with great accuracy. And so by now, most of the measurements of all of the properties of the universe comes from looking at these uh, departures from homogeneity rather than, uh, with some exceptions. But, uh, so so now, let me give I you have, yeah? I have one question from your yeah. slide. Maybe I know this answer, but for those people, those who are not cosmologists, for them I'm asking this, uh, how is it uh, actually where people measure the mean temperature of the CMB? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the measurement of the temperature of the CMB, uh, oh, what happened here? It's, um, um, the measurements of the of the temperature of the CMB. Um, the last measurement uh, was done by the Kobe virus in 1990. This is a long, long time ago. So this was a um, spectrometer that was flown on a satellite and measured the intensity of the cosmic microwave background as a function of frequency. The plot, uh, you can see it on the, on the top right in, the, in this figure. And that measurement 
so it's a perfectly fitted by a black body spectrum uh, with a given temperature, 2.7 something uh, degrees Kelvin. So that's our last measurement of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background was discovered in 65 uh, by Penzias and Wilson. Uh, and in the in between, uh, people were between that and 1990, there were many measurements. And at some point, there were even uh, uh, suggestions that the spectrum was not perfectly uh, thermal and so on. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the measurement at, uh, by Kobe in 1990 uh, you know, settled the question, and and uh, because the universe was so dense uh, in the past, um, um, we expect the black body spectrum to. I mean, the the the, the time scale of uh, of the various interactions that create and destroy photons or change their energy and so on are so are so fast that we expect the universe to thermalize very well. And, um, and so this spectrum is, is expected to be very, very close to, to, um, to a black body spectrum, much better than, uh, you know, I think the, the, the de deviations for, from, uh, uh, from a black body spectrum that Firas was able to constrain are in the 10 to minus five level or something like that. Um, and, and that's, um, we think that the the spectrum is a, a black body even to a better accuracy than that. Yeah. Uh, oh. Another thing just I want to point. So you have separately mentioned it is like CMB temperature and spectrum. So why you separately mention spectrum? Is there any reason? Uh, well, so uh, of course, if the spectrum is that of a black body, is characterized by just one number, the temperature. Yeah, uh, but um, once you start talking about departures from black body, which we haven't seen on average, um, then it depends on what um, what uh, you know. It's no longer just something characterized by just one number. I don't know. You might have a bump in the spectrum somewhere, and then that's not a temperature. That's just say some 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 light radiation emitted by some some electrons in our galaxy in pra and, and and that will screw up the spectrum in some region and not another region so um so what happened in 1990 was the check that this spectrum was well described by a black body and it a black body with a specific temperature okay. um so um but uh, so that's on average the spectrum on average uh but um um also another instrument that, so people already knew that, uh, uh, or thought that uh, if the universe, so the universe today might. might so, uh, Matthias, yeah. uh, there is a comment in the uh, chat box. Somebody yes. has made a comment. It's probably yes. <laughs> not a comment. Yeah, yeah, you can ask. Yeah, yeah. ask, ask. I, I, one thing I want to say, I, it's impossible for me to monitor these things because it's just too much. So. If somebody uh, have any question, please ask. Yeah, yeah ask directly. I, I I cannot see now the the, the comments. So. Oh, my question. So uh, recently, a few weeks ago, um, there was a paper that said that it's possible to measure the temperature from Planck data itself. And I was curious. Do we? And this temperature is uh, like four sigma uh, lower than uh, from Firas. It's like uh, no, I don't think that's uh, some yes uh, to your question. So let's, can I hold on to your question until I talk about the anisotropies and then we can, uh, we can discuss this paper. Okay, just okay. a couple of slides. Um, there will be some movies with the anisotropies. If after that movie, I'm not discuss answering your question, like, remind me, but I, I, I will try to remember. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, what I wanted to say is that uh, starting in 1990, uh, well, people were already um, thinking that from before, much before, that given that the universe is inhomogeneous now, they, all, they also understood this process of gravitation and instability, that things uh, 
the, the instability, the, the differences from place to place grow with time. But so if you extrapolate back to the epoch of recombination, there should be these 380,000 years after the Big Bang from where these photons are coming to us, there should be some, diff, some the universe will not be per, uh, perfectly homogeneous and so there should be some differences in this temperature reflective of the fact that the density and the, of the universe is not exactly the same in every direction and that things are moving around uh, as a result of these gravitational forces. So if you point your telescope at different, uh, measure the temperature of the CMB in different directions, you should see slightly different temperature, okay? And so, um, people were looking for this for a long time because naively, the, uh, the, naive, the most naive estimate, uh, uh, it will, it's not so naive now because we, we put dark matter into the picture, but if there wasn't dark matter, uh, it turns out that um, in, a, in a universe just filled with regular matter, if the universe expands by a factor of two, the contrasts uh, of the density grow by a factor of two. So if today, you know, once a given region, uh, when you measure the density changes by order one from place to place, or say by 1% from place to place, then if you wait till the universe expands by a factor of two, the typical variation on the same scale would be twice as big, okay? Um, and so given that today on some scales, for example, of tens of megaparsecs, we see variations from place to place of order one, if we went back uh, to the epoch of recombination, since that time the universe expanded by a factor of a thousand, naively you would expect there to be differences from place to place of the order of one part in a thousand, okay? But there wasn't, I mean, people, that was the target, people looked and they didn't see anything. Eventually, Kobe found these differences to be like almost a uh, hundred times smaller than that. Um, and, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more, less than 100. But, um, and this in, in the end, it's all to do with dark matter and what the universe is made of and so on. But, uh, but anyway, it took until, uh, for that reason, it took until 1990 something to find these differences. Kobe made the first map with low angular resolution, which is the map on the bottom left. Uh, the, 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 Forget about the red stuff in the middle that's uh, synchrotron emission from our own galaxy. In this projection, our galaxy is a, a plane in, this, in, in the equatorial plane there. And then uh, in the intervening decades, we uh, people um, were able to make better measurements of this temperature and uh, anisotropies, these differences, and also better angular resolution, better detectors, and so on. And the map on the on the right is the the current best map over the whole sky of the temperature and isotropy is produced by this Planck satellite. So pixels are much smaller, uh, noise uh, and um, so uh, and in addition to measuring the cosmic microwave background, we've also, as I was saying, tried to track down uh, how matter is distributed at different times in the history of the universe. So this is uh, um, this is a, uh, a map, if you want, of matter in our observable universe. So because this is the observable part of our universe, we are at the center of this region. Uh, if you look sufficiently far out, you see the cosmic microwave background. Inside of this, you see, I mean, this region here, each dot there is a galaxy, the location of a galaxy uh, measured by, I think, this is an old picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. These regions were not mapped because we didn't have time to point the telescope. And so uh, in here, there's a little movie um, that uh, shows uh, zooming out. So, so this is, in, in a sense, our state of the art, or, or, um, or at least maybe a few years old, of how matter was, or different pros of how matter was, uh, distributed in the universe, more or less, to, or to scale, in the sense of the distances here. Uh, the cosmic micro background is the furthest thing that we can see. We are at the center, and in, in the in-between, we can trace the galaxies, how they are distributed. There's regions where we don't have good maps because there was no map. It took some time from the time of the uh, cosmic micro background uh, uh, recombination until the first 
galaxies that we can detect with our current telescopes formed. And so before that, we just don't have this region here. We don't have good estimates of, uh, of uh, direct measurements of uh, matter. So these, oops, okay. So let me see if I can play this or not. Maybe not. Uh, I don't know what's not liking it. Uh, the, the, um, the circle of death of Apple. Okay, so let's forget about it. So let me, so th th that was, if you, you can just Google it, but if you just uh, look at the CMB and uh, large, large scale structure maps, uh, something like that, or Sloan, you will see this movie where it's flying out and you will see that all these galaxies here, if you, if you fly, fly out here, you cannot see really much, but you will see that they're not distributed homogeneously, they're big, concentrations of galaxies, empty regions, filamentary structure. There's a bunch of structures uh, or the way matter is distributed is kind of uh, peculiar if you want. And this, uh, we, we get a lot of information about what the universe is made of uh, by trying to understand that. Uh, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, uh, on the cosmic microwave background. Um, let's see. Is this something is off with this? Let me try to. Sorry, guys. Um, I don't know. Um, okay, so, um I get uh, you are seeing my screen right, right, but it's not in the full screen mode. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, um, so take this map of the cosmic micro. Around, around uh, this is from some uh, movies that Wayne, who at the University of Chicago produced. So, if you take a little region uh, of this map, just for illustrative purposes you see the temperature differences from place to place. And uh, what we typically do to analyze this kind of uh, data is we imagine making a Fourier transform, if you want, of the temperature as a function of, uh, of um, direction on the sky and, um, and plotting the typical size of those, measuring the RMS, of the coefficients of these Fourier coefficients as a function of scale to see uh, the homogeneities or the sizes of differences uh, as a function of scale. Um, and so he's showing that here. Um, he um, uh, is, um, is showing you this curve like this is what ends up being the spectrum of the so the, the this Fourier transform the, the the RMS of the Fourier coefficients we call it the power spectrum as a function of angular scale this corresponds to 10 degrees this corresponds to one degree this corresponds to a tenth of a degree and so on uh, let's see let me see if I do it full screen again does it work yeah um, and so you know, these are small scales, so he's filtering uh, the map on the range of scales shown by the moving band there. And you can see on large scales, it's just the, you know, the, the on, on low L, this uh, thing here is called the, is, if instead of a Fourier transform, you expanding spherical harmonics, this would be the L of the spherical harmonic. Low Ls correspond to large angular scales. And as you map out, uh, go out into the higher L, it's more and more fine structure in the maps. Um, and there is the, the, uh, the theory and the observations eventually uh, predicted and then the observations shown uh, a very detailed, uh, a very detailed um, curve here with a lot of bumps and wiggles, uh, which depend on the composition of the universe. And, um, and so th since Kobe until Planck, we've measured these better and better and better to try to see all these bumps and wiggles uh, and, uh, and uh, determine the composition of the universe. So for example, 
this is what happens if you calculate what you expect for these curves if you change the amount of uh, the amount of uh, regular matter in the universe this is what you expect to happen if you change the amount of dark matter and so um, and this is if you change uh, our distance to the last scattering surface so um, so um, if you change the amount of regular matter or dark matter, the dynamics is different, right? So if you imagine you're at recombination, there is um, protons and electrons from uh, uh, that are interacting with the radiation. There is dark matter. The dark matter is uh, creating uh, big concentrations, potential wells. This um, regular matter is trying to fall in. Uh, but there is pressure from the radiation that doesn't allow it to do so. And so there's a whole dynamical thing that's happening there. And the results of what happens, uh, it depends on how much dark matter there is versus regular matter versus photons. Uh, so, so if you, if you, um, if you, um, if you change that, all of these structure of peaks and so on, if you look at the shapes, they're all changing because the dynamics at recombination is different. The last uh, curve here is of a different nature. The universe recombined, uh, this radiation comes from uh, uh, the time of recombination, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the temperature was a few thousand degrees Kelvin. Um, now, but then, um, and, and, and because of the dynamics, you produce all these bumps and wiggles in this power spectrum. But you, you, you have to realize that at what angle these structures appear to us depends on how far away the, this last scattering surface is from us. So how, how old the universe, how much time elapsed since these 380,000 years. If, uh, there is some hot spots and cold spots, and we are further away. Then it would look they would look smaller, okay? And so, and that all that it would do is shift um, the curve in right or left because uh, the the same structure just appears smaller. It will make the same curve uh, move to to the higher L's. Um, so as you can see, this is basically what happens in the last uh, curve. Uh, in the last uh, plot, as you change the, the the composition of the universe that affects the late time evolution, not what was happening at recombination, but what is happening now, say the amount of dark energy and so on, you change the amount of expansion of the universe until today, and then you change the angular scale of this curve, but you leave the peak structure almost the same, or the same. You do see some changes at low L's, and this is from another effect, a late time effect called the Sachs-Wolf effect that let me not discuss now, but this is sensitive to the amount of dark energy today. So, but if you ignore this part of very low else, what was happening at recombination, is, which is what says these uh, peaks and so on, it, the physics is the same. It's just that you see it from further away or more nearby. And so it substands a different angle on the sky. And so the curve just shifts laterally, but, not, but the shape doesn't change. So, so by, by uh, yeah. Matthias, I have one question. So yes. uh, can you please again say that what is the uh, interpretation of the first peak, the height of the first peak? Uh, so I didn't mention that much uh, how these peaks come about, but um, um, let me give you, because I have, uh, no, let, let me give you one, one, there are many ways to think about them. This is, uh, let me give you one way. Um, so imagine that you start the universe that is not perfectly homogeneous. So there is uh, more density here, less density there, a little bit. So let's, uh, more here, more there, just small changes. Let's imagine for simplicity that there is, the universe is completely homogeneous, but you put a little bit more matter in just one spot. Okay, what will happen next? Well, um, let's say you start with more of everything, more dark matter, more photons, more uh, regular matter. Um, what will happen? Just picture this in your, in, in your head. So what will happen is, well, the, regular ma the dark matter starts to, col uh, to concentrate more because 
there is, uh, it just feels the force of gravity. Gravity, there's a stronger pull towards this region because there is more matter. And so a little bit more dark matter falls in and then there's more matter there. And so more dark matter falls in. So if the universe was just made of dark matter, that's what will happen. This dark matter will start to accumulate there. What happens to the regular matter, to the electrons and protons in this case? What happens is that they are, before recombination, they are tightly bound with the CMB photons, which uh, uh, makes it that this combined fluid, if you want, of uh, protons, electrons, and the CMB photons, it has a lot of pressure. So because of the uh, one third of C squared, uh, Sound, uh, sound speed of, 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 of a plasma filled with photons. So, um, so as it tries to collapse into this region, the, the, um, it really will not want to do it because of these pressure forces and there will be the equivalent of a sound wave launched from this region that will be traveling out, okay? okay. So that's what will happen in real space. So um, if you want some sort of Green's function of this pro process, if you start with a delta function, uh, uh, a delta function perturbation someplace in the universe, it's a spherical shell of perturbation in the regular matter and the photons that moves out because of this pressure. So there is a sound speed, which is almost one third. Okay, the sound speed square is one third of the speed of light squared moving out and the dark matter, um, kicking in okay so this uh, now what happens if you combine a, so this is kind of the greens function you combine so um, you combine a lot of uh, of these uh, hot uh, places with over densities and densities you will launch these waves from everywhere um so um and and uh the structure of the peaks is a long way to say the structure, the, the peaks is nothing other than the, this Green's function. The, these peaks that you're seeing in the, is nothing other than this Green's function. And these oscillations that you see is nothing other than, you know, you launch this wave, there was a finite amount of time till recombination. So this wave only traveled for a distance. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, this Green's function is zero outside of this, speed of sound times the age of the universe at recombination. So this Green's function is some function and zero afterwards. If you Fourier transform that, it will ring. It will have some ringing because uh, you're cutting off in, you know, if you just Fourier transform some square thingy, it will produce some, uh, the Fourier transform oscillates and the, and the separation of the peaks of this oscillation has to do with how far you know how big this region is. This is all that the, that by by going to Fourier space. Uh, so if you imagine that you had a lot of in real space, a lot of uh, locations where you uh, in hotspots and cold spots where these waves are coming from. So the actual map in real space will be a convolution of these initial conditions with this Green's function. But when you go to Fourier space, it becomes a product, and uh, and. So then you, you can easily, by going to Fourier space, you can easily, because there is no structure in these initial conditions, uh, all the structure in angle comes from the Green's function. And so it's very easy to get this Green's function uh, by, by going to Fourier space. That's why we go to Fourier space. And one of the reasons, and when we plot this, we're basically measuring the Green's function of these dynamics. Uh, and so that's, uh, and so this, this structure of periodic peaks is nothing other than giving you the distance the sound waves were able to travel, which is the speed of uh, sound times the uh, age of the universe. And so you, you get to measure the speed of sound. Now, this, uh, and, and the details also of this uh, Green's function depends on the, what matter, what was the composition of the universe and so on. So that's why, all of the structure of the peaks uh, change, uh, change uh, with that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I have one or two more questions. So if we look into the pictures uh, all over, so we see that if we go for larger values of L, the peak started decaying. So why this decaying occurs? Decay, uh, yes. Um, so um, the reason is the following. So. Um, in the, let, let me continue with this way of explaining it as the, as the Green's function. So 
um, I was telling you there's a wave that goes out and then it doesn't get in, you know it can travel only a, di a given distance and uh, and um, zero outside so if you imagine that this thing was like a square like a square thing is something happening inside and zero outside you Fourier transform you would see this ringing that goes on forever uh, now, however, the, because you had this discontinuity, something inside, nothing in, outside. But for the mean free path of photons is not uh, zero. Uh, the, 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 the density of electrons is finite, and so the photons are able to diffuse a little bit. So they smooth out the, um, this discontinuity in the, uh, and, 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 and this smoothing out, which we call silk damping, um, um, makes the structure on small scales be erased because even if you start with some another way of saying imagine you start with this very small uh, scale differences if photons are able to diffuse from one place to the next everything will be erased because if here there should be hot and there it should be cold but photons can travel from one place to the next then eventually everything gets smoothed out so the decay of the of the of the spectrum is relay is given by the mean free path. Uh, the decay of the power spectrum there is given by the mean free path of the photon. So that's another scale that we can measure. So you know these heights and locations, all of, all of these peaks depends on these physical processes like the silk damping or the whether there is dark matter or not uh, creating these potential wells, and that's how we measure all of these things. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I'm asking too many questions, but yeah, it actually helps helping us to learn a lot of things. So this lower values of L actually corresponds to the large scale structure? Yes. Okay. But uh, from Planck, do, you, uh, do, we, do we have uh, like good uh, data to know about uh, the large scale structure? Uh we'll see the we'll see the we'll see the data in just one slide so let's uh, or a couple of slides i forget let, let, let's wait for that and another thing that once we talk about the primordial physics like inflation and all we actually express the power spectrum in terms of the fourier scale k which is sometimes called momentum here you talk about l which is the angular scale uh, so can you give uh, just one idea that how you can connect b both the scales. The reason here we talk about L and not K is because so the, 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 the units of the Fourier transform wave vector uh, is the inverse of whatever the units of the thing you're Fourier transforming, right? So here in this particular case, the map of the CMB is a two dimensional map in angle. That's what we actually measure oh. as opposed to uh, let's say nearby where we have a map of the location of galaxies where we might measure distances. And so in one case, uh, the Fourier transform is just an angular thing. And so of an angular thing, it's just uh, dimensionless. Okay. And it, when we do K um, is uh, because uh, we are now talking about three dimensional um, space and distances. Now there is a one-to-one -one relation between if you imagine the whole universe and it's inhomogeneous and you cut a, a spherical slide, we make the observation of the CMB, there's a one-to-one -one relation between angular scale and uh, distance given by, and, and, the, and the distance between these hotspots and cold spots given by the distance to the last scattering surface. So in the map, if you see a hotspot is one degree, then you multiply this one degree by the distance and you get a, um, a, a distance between the hotspots. So you could interpret everything not in angle, but in physical separation, if you multiply it by this distance to the last scattering surface, and then you could reconstruct what K vector corresponds to a given L vector. L, one K value corresponds to a given L value um, if you wanted to do it. And, basically uh, the distance to the last scattering surface is around 10,000 co-moving megaparsecs. So if you multiply the K vector by, which is in, has units of one over megaparsecs by this distance, you get the L value that this 
Fourier mode typically contributes to in this map. Perfect. And so uh, let me go back to the question about the temperature of the CMB, okay? Um, so the, I said the, the temperature of the CMB was measured um, with the COVID a long time ago. Now, how, can we measure the temperature of the CMB um, from this kind of curves? This is what this uh, question was about and what this paper was about. Um, the short answer is that, um, that uh, um, not, not as good as we can measure it with, with, uh, with uh, direct measurement. But let, let's see, why, why would this, uh, how can this be measured, okay? Now, what is the temperature of the CMB? The temperature of the CMB today, like when, when I said the temperature of the CMB, 2.7 degrees Kelvin, is the temperature of the CMB today, right? We go back, the temperature is hotter. The temperature of the CMB at recombination when these fluctuations are produced uh, or this map is set is fixed because recombination happens when the hydrogen atoms, you know, form. And that is some, you know, depends on the cross sections and blah, blah, blah. So that's fixed. It has nothing to do with our, cost, our temperature here, right? So the dynamics of recombination doesn't change if the temperature of the CMB changes because, uh, well, or at least the temperature at which the um, at the temperature at which the um, uh, recombination happens is fixed. It has nothing to do with our temperature. However, uh, what our temperature gives us is basically at what point in the history of the universe we are. Right. So if we were to observe wake up and observe 1.7 degrees Kelvin, it just means that the universe has expanded even more since the time of recombination. The temperature of recombination is fixed, right? So um, the, the physics there is fixed. And so, um, and so there is a one-to-one -one relation between, basically the temperature of the CMB is just, when are you? Like you're an alien, you wake up, you measure the CMB, you figure out, Oh, I, it's this many billion years after the recombination. And so the universe, also the expansion rate of the universe for a given composition uh, is changing with time. So once you measure the temperature of the CMB, at least if you have fixed all the composition of the universe, you can figure out how much the universe should, how fast the universe should be expanding at the time that you are making these observations. Nothing is changing in the CMB. It's just about where um, where we are at, okay? And so clearly, if the temperature of the CMB were to have been different, it would have meant that we are at a different epoch in the history of the universe. And as a result, the Hubble constant or the rate of expansion of the universe at that particular time is different. And so you can fix this Hubble tension. If you were to, we would be able to fix the Hubble tension if we were at a different epoch of the universe, right? So if we had a beta mistake in the temperature of the CMB measurement, and uh, we are not, when the, the temperature now is not 2.7 degrees Kelvin, but I don't know, a few percent different than that, then it would mean that we are at a different epoch and the Hubble constant would be different. And so the prediction of the Hubble constant from the CMB or for the Hubble constant that would be today would be different and you can make it agree with the local observation. So that's the idea of this paper. So um, now in order to do so, you need to change the temperature of CMB by a lot, at least in units of, uh, of uh, the measured temperature by COBE virus. And so you need to ignore that measurement. Uh, so only if you ignore that measurement, if we didn't have that measurement, then we could shift around the temperature of the CMB by a lot. The temperature of the CMB, yeah, by a lot, and the Hubble constant by a lot, and there would be no problem. But so, uh, if you want to change the CMB temperature in order to change the Hubble, so change when we are in the history of the universe, you need to change the CMB temperature by much more than uh, than uh, than it's allowed by the Kobe virus measurement. So, I, I think that that's the, the what the paper that paper is quantifying all of these. 
uh, in more detail. It's, it's not that it wasn't known before. Um, and just saying, by if you if you were to move the temperature to make it agree to make the Hubble constant agree with the local measurements, how many sigmas these would be off by the fire as uh, for the uh, for the measurement of the direct temperature, so that you can you know see if you want to do that or not. I don't know. So so my in my opinion, um, the fire as temperature measurement is much more trustworthy than the local measurements of the Hubble expansion. So I wouldn't go that route, but it's a matter of choice, I suppose. But you cannot have it both ways. You cannot fit the CMB. You, you cannot be consistent with the measurements of the cosmic micro background temperature and, and also be consistent with the local measurements of the Hubble constant. One of the two have to be wrong. So. If you want to use that as an explanation that we're just seeing, we're just at a different point in the expansion of the universe that we thought. And, that, and that's why the Hubble constant predicted by the model, it, it didn't agree, but now that you realize that you're at a different time, now everything is good. Uh, but, of course, but yeah, it, 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 does that answer the question or no? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Do people hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear. Ah, okay, okay, good. Because well, there, there, there is a uh, some delay, time delay happening. Oh, okay. Um, so okay, so uh, for this, so basically, for the last uh, in the last twenty years, uh, we've had this standard model of. Uh, for cosmology that we have been testing and testing and has been getting better and the test has been getting better and better but the model basically has not uh, uh, you know it's it has uh, worked very well and it's a model in which the universe is filled with a cosmological constant or some sort of dark energy that leads to an accelerated expansion of the universe at late times it's filled with dark matter. It lived with. It fi it's filled with regular matter, um, and uh, and we've made a lot of measurements in the last twenty years. These are examples of the measurements uh, of the Planck satellite. So you can see the actual spectrum of the cosmic microwave background uh, anisotropies as measured. Where is my cursor? I don't see it. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, as um, as measured by Planck, the radiation is also a little bit polarized. So we measure the polarization anisotropies. You can see the very small residual. The 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 line is a is a model which has six parameters. Basically, uh, the the relevant parameters are really the distance to the last scattering surface and the composition of the universe, which is the amount of regular matter and dark matter, and the residuals are very small. There's barely any, I mean, th there are places where you can see uh, little bumps and, and dips and so on that we obsess about, but there's just, you know, from the big picture is that there's percent and sub percent measurements of this uh, amplitude of fluctuation as a function of scale. This translates into sub percent errors on many uh, on these few parameters of this cosmological model. This allows you to make predictions for a bunch of other observations, and those uh, predictions seem to work out. Um, the, the Planck uh, measurements are very, very accurate. They're sub-percent measurements uh, of the anisotropies. Uh, and so when you use this model to predict uh, the results of other observations, you make predictions that are you know, very accurate. And uh typically so uh matthias yeah, yeah. in uh, here i if, if you just uh, consider three plots i have seen that uh, the all the plots are divided into two parts by drawing a line at l equal to 30 or so so yes. why this is so uh, like why this two region because i can see that l greater than 30 is very accurate and l less than 30 is not that much yes good so um so um, 
the, the, the error bars in this plot have two components. Okay, one component is how good your measurement is, your apparatus, whatever, that's one component. But there's another component called cosmic variance uh, that we call cosmic variance, which is the following. So um, we cannot predict that the, in that direction of the sky, there should be a hot spot or a cold spot or whatever. It's just uh, the predictions from the theory are pred statistical predictions about the amplitude of the, you know, of these Fourier modes as a function of scale. But the number of Fourier modes as a function of L is 2L plus one. So if you measure all the Fourier components at L equals two, there's only five numbers, right, that you've measured. And the prediction is about the variance of the distribution of these five numbers. That's what the curve is. What's the variance of the distribution of these five numbers? Well, the variance of the distribution of L equals two uh, um, multiples, or L equal three, or L equal 10, or L equal 100. For every L, we can tell you what is the variance of that distribution if you did the histogram of all the L values. But, of, but at L equals two, you only measured five numbers. So your ability, even if you measure them perfectly, your ability to know the variance of the distribution of L equals two numbers with only five samples is not very good, right? You just cannot do it much better than something, not very good. Um, and that's why the error bars there are large because there's less Fourier modes. If you go to L of a thousand, there is, you know, 2000 samples at this L, okay? And each of the dots here at L equals higher are even beams of maybe 50 L. So there. So L equals 1,050 beams of L around it. So there's 50,000 points. So you can measure the variance very accurately while uh, at low L, not very good. And so that's the reason Eventually, your angular resolution of the experiment is not so good, and so you cannot make map, uh, you know, you just cannot make measurements there, and so the error bars start uh, uh, blowing up again. The separation um, between uh, this dotted line is something else, is that um, for whatever the reason, um, they, cho they choose to plot the L's from 2 to 30 in a logarithmic spacing, but from 30 onwards in a linear spacing. So they, they didn't want to choose between log X axis or linear X axis. They wanted to have different in different regions. So they did this trick and it makes, in my opinion, the plots look crazy, especially the polarization plots, they look strange. But this is some convention that people have because the peaks are separated by a fixed amount in linear spacing. Uh, and so they want to keep the linear spacing at, at uh, high L. But if you did that, you barely see what's happening between two and 30 because everything gets very compressed if you just uh, do linear space. So they want it. And there are some effects like this sax wall effect that lives in the low L. So it's nice to see there in more detail. So they came up with this, procedure i don't know uh, so it's just an artifact of the plotting okay. but if you look at the polarization plots at the low at the right hand side it looks like a big discontinuity at 30 and this discontinuity is all about the plotting procedure okay um, okay so so what I was saying is that then you compare the prediction from this model, you extrapolate and ask the question, what should different things, different other measurements um, should see? And typically what happens in, so these are different, I'm not going to go through all the plots. They're different probes of the matter or the expansion history at different epochs in the history of the universe. The top plots are more accurate, so they're, the other measurements are percent level measurements. And you can always see in these, um, in these plots some line, which is just the prediction, not the fit to these data, but the prediction from the model fitted to the CMB. Uh, so there's a bunch of percent level things that agree. There's a 
a bunch of 10% level measurements that agree. And, you know, for the most part, all of these other measurements are not as accurate as Planck. So there is a prediction of Planck, which has the, the error bar is shown by the line there with the width. So the extrapolation of the Planck model is very accurate compared to our, our other measurements. And so that's the reason I was saying that um, we are now in a situation we, for the most part, if the CMB can give you, if the CMB is sensitive to some effect, uh, that effect has been measured much more precisely than we can measure it again with these other probes. So, um, so in that sense, the CMB still dominates uh, the the information that we have, assuming everything is okay. Sometimes, first of all, sometimes the CMB is unable to measure certain things because they are things that happen late in the history of the universe, and so the CMB doesn't care about them, or maybe the CMB is wrong in some way, and then you would see a big departure. Uh, but if everything is like vanilla stuff, um, the CMB has the smallest error bars. And the, la the last plot on the bottom right is the measurements of the Hubble parameter, the Hubble constant, the rate of expansion of the universe today. And there you can see that uh, the measurements in the bluish color uh, are the measurements from locally measuring how fast the universe is expanding by making measuring distances to nearby galaxies or far away galaxies but nearby compared to the CMB um, and how fast they are moving by Doppler shift. That's the bluish color. The prediction from the CMB measurements by Planck is the reddish thingy and they are discrepant by some four four and a half sigma. Uh, or a 10% in the measurement, but 10% in the value, but it's like a four or five sigma. That's the biggest discrepancy in the model today. And a lot of people are wondering whether or not this is signaling some uh, problem or uh, in the model as opposed to some problem in the measurement. Um, um, okay, good. So, um so the, the the questions that are that, that are still around uh i mean we, we we have this model it fits very well i'm trying to make it sound like everything is very good but of course the composition of the universe is mainly made by things that are not the regular matter so there is a lot of dark matter there is this dark energy uh we would like to know more about those um there's uh, neutrinos and their masses. So there's a bunch of questions about the composition of the universe. We don't know what the dark matter is or how, when in the history of the universe it was created. For that matter, it, with, with the standard model, we, we cannot even get the baryons to work out, uh, so-called biogenesis. We need a process to, to create the abundance of baryons that we see. Um, and then there are questions about what happened before this period of the hot big bang. What came before? Uh, maybe inflation, maybe something else. Um, was there anything left over from this time that we can measure? Um, and then there's a bunch of other questions about uh, the about the uh, astrophysical processes that happened in various times in the history of the universe that uh, we still no not so much about for example the epoch of the formation of the first stars or the details of how galaxies form and why why they look the way they look and and uh, produce stars in the way they seem to do as a function of the history of the universe or why the galaxies uh, have supermassive black holes in their center so there's a lot of questions about uh, very peculiar perhaps uh, things that uh, the universe managed to produce and, and 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 how things came about that we still don't understand so these are the three types of of questions that we still have in in, in cosmology things are trying to get more information about the composition that we've determined try to understand what happened before the hot phase of the big bang and also then for the during the hot phase of the Big Bang, a bunch of as more astrophysically related questions about the objects that we see. Um, so let me, so one of the examples is this time of the first stars. 
Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention quickly is the fact that, uh, uh, I mean, for the, at least for this program, the, the more, more phenomenological part of cosmology, we build this history through finding things and, uh, and making measurements. Uh, and um, so if we wanted to know what happened before this hot phase of the Big Bang, it would be good if something was left over. And we know things were left over. So um, from, from whatever happened before the hot Big Bang, in particular, we know that these small inhomogeneities that we see in the CMB and then they grow uh, to, to form the structure that we see, they were not produced during the hot phase of the Big Bang. They were left over from whatever happened before. And that's a very profound discovery that, that was made. Uh, I mean, uh, Observationally, I think it, um, around the year 2000, I would say, uh, so that the that these the, the peaks, the the fluctuations that produce these peaks in the CMB were not produced. They're, they're fossils from before the hot phase of the Big Bang. Let's call it inflation or whatever came before. Um, they cannot be produced because we observationally we can measure both densities and velocities, and we see that the they are inconsistent with almost by some causality argument um, by almost no by some I mean it's just very tight argument that these fluctuations cannot come from the hot face of the Big Bang it has to be from before and so this is great we by studying these acoustic peaks not only will we are we getting information about the composition but by by studying the size of fluctuations as a function of scale uh, for example, we are getting information about the process that produced these original fluctuations, um, and that ha happened before the hot phase of the Big Bang. So that's the reason why there is some hope that we will sort out uh, at some point or another um, the, the um so in the you know the, the cartoons that people draw these days they add to the hot face of the big bang something that came before and the the, the standard uh, our standard in the field is uh, cosmic inflation an epoch of accelerated expansion that we call cosmic inflation which per leaves these uh the perturbations that 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 we see in in the large scale structure and the cmb or the the or the, the the seeds that then grow through all these dynamical processes that uh, I was discussing before to see to form the structure that we see today. So by looking at this structure, we we get both information about the original seeds and the dynamical processes that made them evolve in time. And because these dynamical processes depends on the composition of the universe, we get information about the composition. So we get everything these days from trying to get as much as possible, uh, to try to understand that as much as possible. Um, and there's also a potentially a second thing left over from uh, the epoch of inflation, if that's what happened, which is a stochastic background of gravitational waves. So just the same quantum mechanical process that creates the density fluctuations might have left uh, a background of gravitational waves and we are uh, the universe is transparent, was transparent always to these gravitational waves. Um, so they are everywhere, um, but uh, they can be detected also using uh, measurements in, of the CMB, in this, in this case, the CMB polarization. So um, what happens is that if the well, universe... Matthias, yeah. just one yeah. question. So uh, what do you mean by stochastic background can you a little bit elaborate this yes uh, what i mean is that uh, there are gravitational waves um, that have uh, uh, they're moving in every direction um, and the best way to describe and the amplitude is just uh, the best way to describe it is some, some uh, uh, random collection of gravitational waves moving in every direction and with a wide range of uh, frequencies uh, whose 
so, and so it's a, some sort of stochastic thing. It's not uh, the gravitational waves coming from the merger of two specific black holes that have, you know, a very definite frequency. They come from this direction and blah, blah, blah. No, this is a, a gravitational waves that fill the entire universe. If you're in a place, there's passing through, they're coming from every direction and uh, they a, a wide range of frequencies. And the best way to describe them is to just think of them as some sort of stochastic uh, process, some sto stochastic leftover. Meaning we don't, cannot predict, oh, if I'm here, there should be a gravitational wave of this amplitude moving, you know, towards the large Magellanic clouds. No, I mean, we don't know, but how to predict in that level of detail, but we can tell you there should be this amount of the power in gravitational waves in every direction, roughly speaking, and in this range of frequencies and so on. That's okay. what I mean. And another question that uh, uh, you have mentioned about inflation. If inflation you don't have, then you can't able to produce the peaks. So like from this, uh, up, up to this point, can you able to distinguish? We can, the, because you know that there are people uh, follow idea kind of like some kind of bouncing cosmology or something like that. Yes. So, so at this point, can you able to distinguish between these two physics, the inflation or bouncing and like uh, can bouncing didn't produce that kind of peak no no yeah I, 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 yeah good i didn't say that uh, inflation um is the only way to produce these peaks what i meant is that this what i wanted to say at least is that um the 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 so l let's go back to this uh, history of the universe of the hot big bang you could imagine you know, we've observed the fluctuations uh, at the epoch of recombination. When were they produced to start with? Maybe anywhere in this period of time. I don't know, maybe a second after the Big Bang when everything was hot and so on. No, this cannot happen. So in the normal part of a hot Big Bang filled with radiation expanding in the way of the hot Big Bang, you cannot produce these seeds. The seeds needs to be produced in some other period before. Um, now, in, um, this doesn't mean it's only inflation that can produce it. You, you, you need to create something before this period to create the, those fluctuations. Yeah. Inflation yeah. does that. Yeah. Other things might also do it. But um, like, I am a little bit like interested to know that, is it possible to distinguish both of them? I think, uh, well, first, let me say that um, uh, th what is the big, uh, le let, me, let me say it like this. Um, the big um, issue is that um, um, there's this, the, the concept of the horizon. How, let, let me go back and talk about that a little, a little bit. So at any given time in the history of the hot Big Bang or any, but let's say there is a distance, a maximum distance separation uh, that things could have moved uh, since, the hot, since the Big Bang because there was no more time than that, right? And so this is what we call the, the, the horizon. It changes with time that as the universe becomes older and older, it's bigger and bigger. Um, um, so what we have observed, in the cosmic microwave background is that we've seen fluctuations that are in a sense bigger than this horizon at the time of recombination. Meaning you, if you wanted to produce these structures that we see in the cosmic microwave background somewhere in the hot Big Bang, you would somehow need to move matter around over distances that are larger than the age of the universe times the speed of light, uh, okay, at 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So, so that's why it cannot be done, right? Um, now, you, so you somehow need to create uh, these fluctuations and make them appear to be separated by more than na with this naive distance. That, so you, you have to modify this history such that something that appears to be separated by more than what things could have traveled now is suddenly possible because the history in the beginning is different, right? So you, you need, we, we say that we see fluctuations that start 
outside of the horizon, be, be, become being bigger than the, this cosmic horizon. So you need to be able to create fluctuations and, and make them appear at least uh, larger than the horizon by changing the history uh, and, and such that the, your, if in some sense, your calculation of the horizon was a little bit cooler. Um, inflation does that. Now, the, 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 that's all that we've observed, that we see super horizon fluctuations and the peaks and the velocities in a very detailed way of, uh, of, of making this statement. But basically, that's what, we, that, what we've seen. So as long as you're able to put things outside the horizon, this structure of peaks and so on will work out. So yeah, if you change it, inflation it by classical. something else, sorry, 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 what do you say? So uh, everything becomes classical when you are talking about the super horizon. Yes, everything becomes classical and everything, um, um, also the, 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 the structure of peaks, the fact that there are peaks, all of this stuff is just follows from being super horizon, okay? Mm. And so as long as you manage to put something, you, you manage to extend and, and to have the peaks look nice and so on, the, the, these fluctuations need to be outside of the horizon for a sufficiently long time, meaning as long as you created the big, whatever, you changed the Hardwick Bank, added something sufficiently early on that puts, uh, puts these fluctuations on super horizon scales, what appear to be super horizon scales for a later observer if he doesn't know about this modification, right? This is what I mean. It's okay. not that anything travels faster than light. And it's just that, uh, you know, if you ignored and you just had the hot Big Bang, it would appear to you that these are super horizon scales. As long as you did it sufficiently back in compared to the 380,000 years, which every modification that people think about does that because, uh, you know, have to preserve big magnetosynthesis and all of okay so it's always in the very early universe then the the observations will be the same you cannot distinguish them uh from on the basis of the peaks uh oh. you have to be a, you know you have to say something else like for example perhaps might be different in the two models or perhaps one can produce gravitational waves and the other one cannot produce, but it's a little bit more of a detail of what exactly was the origin of this perturbation. So, um, I mean, the, the problem I think with, with trying to make the fluctuations be there to be some sort of, the big bang being some result of a bounce and the fluctuation, which is some other model that people like, or some people like, I don't know. Um, and the fluctuations to be produced before these bounds, and then there be a bounce, and then the, back, the whole big bang. Uh, the problem with that is a technical problem of how do you make a universe bounce? Because with uh, regular matter, it doesn't bounce. Uh, and there, you're going through some sort of singularity, which you have to smooth in some way. Are you sure that the fluctuations that you computed in the previous universe, uh, in the previous history of the universe, go through these bounds and don't get something, you know, what, what exactly are you predicting? These are the questions. But if you manage to change and have super horizon scales through a bounds, then I think the current observations cannot distinguish them. Some people say that, um, that gravitational waves are much more difficult to produce in these alternative models. Uh, yeah. and, and so if we found those, maybe inflation, um, that, that's more natural to be produced in inflation, but of course, not every model of inflation produces gravitational waves. So, yeah, and there's, there's no, these bouncing models or alternative models, none of them are at a level of theoretical control as, uh, inflation and so their predictions are more uncertain so it's not even clear sometimes exactly what is the prediction and whether the type of matter that you need to make the bounce actually can be made without having some other problems somewhere else. okay so complicated i would say thank you um okay so blah blah so the second fossil is the stochastic background of gravitational waves that um 
that uh, are uh, leave an imprint in the C in the polarization pattern of the CMB. So if we can measure the polarization of the CMB, we are using, in a sense, the motion of the electrons at recombination as some gigantic uh, um, gravitational wave detector. Um, and so these are this this stochastic background. We are not thinking that we, at the moment at least, we can detect them on Earth like LIGO detects gravitational waves. But we are using the motions of matter at recombination to um, as our test mirrors of the LIGO detector in some sense, uh, not exactly, but something along those lines. And so. It turns out that the motions uh, of matter produced by gravitational waves are different than the motions of matter, their pattern. Uh, they have a curl type pattern, the velocity uh, are different from regular, uh, if the, there's no gravitational wave. So if we can manage to make this measurement, we, we might be able to see if that the universe was filled with gravitational waves 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And so a lot of people are trying to um to to go after this measurement to go after these gravitational waves to try to uh pin down uh what came before the hot phase of the big bang and one thing that uh, people like to show is um is the amplitude of the gravitational waves and the other measure so properties of these primordial seeds that were produced by in inflation or whatever came before the hot big bang two 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 uh properties of these seeds was whether or not there are gravitational waves and so the amplitude of those gravitational waves so that's the y axis in this plot um and then on the x axis is the density fluctuations that lead to the large scale structure how they depended on scale if you were to look at uh, the size of fluctuations on different physical scales, how different were they? Um, most, for the most part, they are what we call scale invariant. And so the x, the x axis tries to give a measure of that. The number one corresponds to perfectly scale invariant fluctuations. And so the contours there are current constraints on the amplitude of the gravitational wave and the tilt the, of the spectrum, the, the scale dependent. And the points uh, are different inflationary models. And I'm showing, I don't have much time to discuss uh, this in detail, uh, but I just wanted to mention that current constraints already ruled out some of the most simple models that at least uh, when I was growing up, you, that's what they would teach you in uh, you know, some class because it was the simplest to compute those are already not allowed uh, by the data. And so we think we can make measurements of the amplitude of gravitational waves that are 10 times better or even more uh, improvement from what we have now in the next coming de decade or so. And, uh, and so a lot of these uh, simple inflationary models, one of them might be the truth and we will see these gravitational waves or if not, uh, we will have to give at least those models. Uh, just a question that uh, we know that there are lots of models uh, in the literature but uh, do you have like some uh, comment that which class of model or which models are good at present right now yeah so i think um, there are um, yeah so of course because inflation happens so much early in the history of the universe that I probably at an early if, if it is what happens, right? And then an energy scale so high compared to uh, what we have measured in the lab, there's a lot of freedom uh, about uh, what could be happening. And so the range of predictions is rather large. Now, um, so um, you can have various uh, reasons to favor some type of models or over some other type of models. Um, and there are you know, theoretical reasons of people doing model building and trying to understand them in the context of something else, maybe string theory, some some theoretical arguments. And then there are some uh, uh, more phenomenological uh, summary of the situation. So let me give a, a phenomenological summary. So um, 
Um, so whatever came before inflation, let me I always say inflation again. So inflation has to end, that we know, okay? And so um, the, the, the fluctuations that we see in the, in the uh, that leads to large scale structure are produced in sequentially in time during inflation. So the larger scales are produced earlier, the uh, smaller scales are produced later, okay? And so um, as time progresses during inflation, you're getting closer and closer to the end of inflation. To the extent that you're very far to the end of inflation, then in, during this inflationary period, everything looks the same as a function of time. And so fluctuations of different scales that were produced at different times end up having the same amplitude because everything is almost time translation invariant, nothing is changing. But in detail, something has to be changing because inflation is going to end. So the closer you are to the end of inflation, um, some, you know, the things are a little bit different, right? Uh, and so the, then, then uh, as a result, you don't expect fluctuations to be perfectly scale invariant, all the scales to be exactly the same because some are produced closer to the end than others. And so there's always been this prediction that the fluctuations cannot be perfectly scale invariant, but they, they, they have to change a little bit with scale. And uh, because from the time uh, the, the fluctuations that we see, the largest ones that we see in the CMB were created, the universe probably inflation lasted for additional 60 e folds of this inflation. The typical size of this number of the tilt for the difference from the scale invariant, one minus this tilt, is, was expected to be one over the 60, roughly. I mean, the different models, maybe two over 60, five over 60, whatever. So uh, this, uh, and this is kind of where it landed. So, um, but so, but, but, uh, so this is one explanation for this, uh, for this tilt. So meaning everything was changing slowly. So more than, Now there's another uh, option, which is that nothing was changing very much. And okay, there's some other reason for this tilt. And then there was a sudden transition at the end. Those models tend to produce very little gravitational waves, sometimes even non-observable levels. Um, uh, so more the, because there's a big connection between the size of the gravitational waves and the rate of change of the Hubble parameter during inflation at the time that we are um, seeing the, the fluctuation. So that's why I'm saying if everything is a smooth thing and we are getting towards the end, because we're getting towards the end, everything is changing and there's no sudden transition, then this uh, rate of change of the Hubble parameter is not going to be very small and then you will produce a lot of gravitational waves. Contrary to that, if you say that in inflation end with some phase transition of some kind, so previous to getting there, there's no, there's no, nothing is changing. You don't see any, uh, you know, smooth uh, thing towards the end, but it was nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you go to a cliff, those models produce very little gravitational waves. So that's what we would learn uh, if we see or don't see gravitational waves, whether things are happening more smoothly or there is some sort of, uh, you know, in bet between the when in the history of inflation, the modes that we see are produced and the end of inflation, there is some sort of sudden jump or change. Um, that's what we would learn. I don't know wh whether or not one of the things is more plausible than the other. Um, I think even the, even the, um, the more theoretical arguments have, shifted in time and sometimes one thing makes more sense than the other i don't know i think the measurements will tell us that's my point of view but uh, okay perfect and um one yeah thing that uh, like by uh, whatever you told till now so uh, like from that you like it seems that you were uh, all the fluctuations appearing is basically gaussian okay. yes but we also heard about something called non-Gaussian. It is like, it is mm -hmm. maybe very small till now because we haven't correct prediction yes. of that. 
but yes. uh, is there is any hope to measure such things in near future or from plan because as far as i know that the initial goal was to detect this kind of deviations yes so um so yeah so this is uh, brings me to to i wanted to discuss this a little bit um um yes indeed um the fluctuations, the, these initial seeds appear to be distributed as a Gaussian distribution. So these are plots of a histogram. Uh, uh, so the y-axis is in the log of the temperature measure, measured in different, pre, I mean, just pick any of them. That's the temperature. Um, and you can see the, this is by W map, I think some old measurement that I could find that we no longer make the plots like this, but this is easy to explain. So. It's just a histogram. It looks of the temperature in different pixels on the map, and it looks like a perfect Gaussian. Okay, so um, perfect Gaussian distribution. Um, so um, and this is expected in the context of inflation, uh, but we also expect that in many situations there will be small departures from this. And this was one of the goals and uh, of Planck to put. Uh, to try to detect these fluctuations, these departures from a Gaussian distribution. Um, and it put very stringent upper limits. And, and what things, um, yeah, and, and, and the, the origin uh, um, of, um, of this Gaussian distribution, at least in the context of inflation, each of these Fourier modes of the fluctuations behaves in the in the field of the inflaton behave like a harmonic oscillator in the vacuum state. If it was a free theory, it would be like uh, the, each of the modes is a harmonic oscillator. The, in the ground state, the, the wave function is a Gaussian. That's the origin of this Gaussian. To the extent it's not a free theory, there's little interactions between the different Fourier modes. This is changed. And that's one of the reasons um, we expect uh, changes uh, to this Gaussian distribution. And um, yeah, and in, in, there's a lot of structure in, 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 those, in those departures once you find them that uh, will allow you to, if you find them, figure out the structure of interactions between the fluctuations during inflation and also um, give us quite a bit of insight into the actual origin. Are there really vacuum fluctuations of a field with small departures uh, because of some small interactions? If the, if the fluctuations are the fluctuations of the field that is controlling the length of time the universe inflates in different parts, uh, in different special points that well, sometimes people call this the inflator then these fluctuations uh, are forced by basically the, they're forced to be very small um, and uh, and they are not allowed to be of certain kinds and so if we were to see uh, departures from Gaussianity of certain kinds uh, we would know that this cannot be the case. So there's a lot of information encoded in these departures from Gaussianity. And, and Planck put very stringent constraints, didn't observe them uh, and put very stringent constraints. And uh, the field wants to, what we want to do is to improve those constraints or try to find these, fluctua these uh, departures from Gaussianity uh, with the future experiments. Uh, most probably, um, yeah, these experiments um, will not have, will not be um, CMB experiments because the number of, mo I mean, we've mostly exhausted the information in the primordial CMB. Uh, and so we will need to move to something else. So I was going to talk, I, I, I want to uh, start wrapping up because I've been talking for a long time. So, um, so let me let me um, let me go to one last point that I wanted to say. So, uh, 
we've mainly exhausted the information in the cosmic microwave background, not a hundred percent. So there's still, I mean, these uh, polarization measurements are going to tell us quite a bit, both about the gravitational waves, but also allow us to have a few, a few more modes to measure. But uh, uh, there's a lot more information in addition uh, by making detailed maps of uh, the distribution of matter at, at late times. Um, and in principle, there's much more information there than in the CMB because the CMB can only allow us to measure a two dimensional surface in the universe. Uh, but uh, all the volume inside we could map and we could get many, you know, this problem that I've mentioned before. Were to map the entire uh, volume of the universe inside of the CMB would be much larger than the number of numbers that we, number of pixels on the sky that we me measure with the CMB, which is so on the order of millions. Um, it would be much, much more by many, many orders of magnitude. So we could say a lot more about the statistical properties of these fluctuations, their distribution, whether it's Gaussian or not, their scale dependence, and so on. Um, and so I think uh, part of the future of the field is trying to bring, trying to measure uh, the distribution of matter at late times in, in, in the more nearby universe. But this picture shows you that, uh, you know, the, the, the bag is a bunch of galaxies as measured by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and as I was telling you, the fluctuations start small, but they grow. And so following this process of structure formation, becomes more and more complicated as a function of time, uh, theoretically. And so if we want to get additional information um, about the early universe from the development of structure in the late universe, which is one of our goals, the, it, it's, it's a much more challenging uh, endeavor than the CMB because the dynamics has gone sufficiently complicated that the universe has formed on, on small scales all kind of structures, galaxies, and so on, which uh, we cannot, at the present time at least, um, you know, calculate from first principles what uh, what you know how the properties of galaxies and things like that. And if we are using galaxies to trace the uh, distribution of matter in the late universe, but we cannot calculate from first principles where you should form a galaxy and its properties, that adds a level of uncertainty that is a very much of a challenge for the field to overcome if we want to use all of this information at the level of subtlety that is needed because now measurements have been so good from the CMB. The CMB is fortunate enough that everything was simple enough at the time that all our calculations are basically first principle calculation. We do not have any, you know, phenomenological model of uh, you know, how stars form or the effect of stars on God, that all those things start playing a, a role, not a big role, depending on the epoch of the universe and on the scale that you're talking about, but a role. And unless you have that all under control, it's more complicated to make, uh, to make um, um, those predictions that are accurate enough. But a lot of progress have happened in the last uh, few years in trying to understand what of our predictions for the late universe are robust uh, to these uncertainties, which ones are less robust, how can we incorporate these uncertainties in ways that will not bias our results, uh, even if there are certain things that we don't know, et cetera. So, a lot of the work, I mean, I, I will not show you much because I don't have time, but uh, a lot of the things that I've been involved in in the last few years is trying to understand and make predictions for the, for the development of structure at late times and be very careful in, in, in figuring out and having under control the uncertainties so that they can be used as the data improves to make better measurements one of my primary interests is of these non-Gaussianities, in fact, because of their um, of their potential of telling us something more about uh, what happened before the, you know, about inflation. So uh, 
let me stop there and and just take questions because it's uh, I already am over the one hour and so. No, it's perfect. So anybody wants to ask question to Matthias? And before that, uh, like we have to clap for giving such a nice and elaborative talk and uh, which basically cleared a lot of confusions. So we have to clap for that. And now you guys can ask questions. Please ask to Mat Matthias. Uh, if you have Hi, Matthias. I have a question. Hi. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you know, like you just touched on it very briefly about Hubble tension. And I don't know what is, what is your thought about whether it'll go away or are there other experiments on the horizon that can tell us more about the, about the discrepancy? Yes. Um, so I think at some level, I'm not the best person to um, discuss this because I am less excited about this than uh, than uh, uh, other other people um, are. So um, it's statistically a big tension. Um, I think, um, but I am given the hist so there's two things that make me think that um that this is a uh measurement problem and that i personally am more inclined to think that the local measurements of the hubble constant are screwed up now this is a very biased view because i worked on the cmb for a long time and so maybe it's bias view, but that's my uh, thoughts. And, and, and the reason, two reasons that, that I have, first of all, is the history of uh, the, measure, the local measurements of the Hubble constant. And I don't think there's ever been a time in the history of cosmology since the measurement from Hubble itself, where, the, the, where, where there's no problems with these measurements. Uh, and uh, and of course huge improvement right since the time of hubble but always an issue because the measurements of distances are very tough and so um i am always suspicious and so that's why i'm one of the reasons i'm suspicious about that um i think this will get much better they will there's uh, I, so th these me local measurements are you have to do this, um, what's called this distance ladder. We cannot, we, you need to get a distance to a very far away, relatively far away galaxy. We don't, and, and, and the, you know, there's no way to do that. We don't have a, a, a measuring rod that we can launch to there. So you have to see something there in that galaxy whose brightness you know, typically supernovae. Um, supernovae you need but then you need to calibrate them how bright these supernovas are intrinsically and whether or not they um they uh they might vary from galaxy to galaxy according to metalist or what have you so th those supernovae are calibrated using something else because uh in order to you, you, you just usually do use using cepheids those cepheids were calibrated originally uh, in some other way. And so there's many steps. Now there are new calibrations, there, there are different ways of doing these steps of the calibration. Um, and so there, including, uh, you know, geometrical methods for, for cepheids that are in our galaxy with the, with the Gaia satellite. So this is going to get better. And I'm hoping that this uh, will, will allow to make some progress. Um, the other reason why I am very suspicious that this is a, so that this is not just a measurement fluke is that, okay, you can say maybe the CMB measurements are wrong, right? Uh, so there's two options. The CMB measurements are wrong. The physics of recombination is wrong. Those are the two things that are going into the, those measurements. Unfortunately, the, 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 if you th say the physics of recombination is wrong, something else is happening, some early dark energy, something or other, people are trying and 
problem is that the measurements of the CMB are so accurate and the discrepancy is so large in those units. It's like a 10% discrepancy on something that we've measured to you know, a fraction of a percent. And so as a result, whenever you start mocking up with you add some barely drug, you screw it. And you start having never getting very nice fit to, you know, it's just difficult because you want to change 10% things, but you have a 0.1% measurement, it's not easy. So I think there's no easy way to change the I mean there are things out there for for the most part, the things out there allow you to get some in sufficient freedom to make the tension smaller, but they cannot allow you to measure the how, you know, it doesn't, it's just a little bit of freedom to make them from the four and a half sigma to two and a half sigma. So fine, maybe the solution, but but that's to me very, um, very, uh, this very um, unsatisfying. This is happening, this is gonna, then it goes away. You know, you're putting a lot of bells and whistles into the things, a much more complicated fine tune at the time to do it and then disappear so that it doesn't show up here and there and so on, just to alleviate from a four and a half sigma to a two and a half sigma. It's much easier for me to believe that the sigma determination is wrong, right? By a factor of two, then that all of this complication is happening. So, so that's why I, I'm typically, of the wait and see attitude now, um, but uh, but I'm in the minority. I think a lot of people think that this is a that this is something uh, uh, to be worried about much more than I think it's uh, something to be worried about, and that is signaling perhaps some breakdown of the model. I don't know. There there are new the, eventually there is for example gravitational waves. Uh, that uh, the standard siren technique, there will be other measurements like that. So we will get to the bottom of it, I think, but it'll take some time. Uh, can you reduce enough the error bars for the gravitational wave estimate? Of not in the near future. Uh, not in the near future, I don't think. Um, no, not even well, uh, extreme mass ratio spirals? Yes, but that's not in the near future because okay. we cannot, uh, we, we, I mean, in near future, I say something, to be done with LIGO. Um, so this, you, you need a electromagnetic counterpart. For the moment, the only source with an electromagnetic counterpart are merging neutron star binaries. We had one of those uh, and it's plotted in, that, in there. The, the, um, the error bar for each individual one of them is very large. And so you have to average over many of them. Um, and so, but eventually this might, uh, I mean, that's a matter of waiting, but also I think to be honest, given the history of the whole thing, I would say, I mean, it's one thing to make a measurement uh, of something, you know, with the good error bars and you measure it. It's something else to have a lot of crappy measurements and combine them and the root end takes you where you want to go because um, when you are in the second situation, you, you, there's always these systematic problems with the measurement device and so on that are hard to, um, that, 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 that are hard to see because each measurement is not so good. And so in each individual measurement, you cannot notice that there's something wrong. And then you average them all down. You think it's square root of n, but then you hit some floor somewhere. This is happening all the time, right? So, for example, uh, just to go back to something completely non-controversial, the Hubble measurement of the Hubble constant was off by a factor of there was also some you know, uh, oh, 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 confusion with something else. So things like that, uh, uh, unknown unknowns of uh, Donald Rumsfeld that affect all of your measurements. And they're so small that you haven't noticed them. But then by the time you do the square root of n, they dominate. And so they no longer allow you to um, allow you to reduce the error bars by square root of n because all your measurements are affected by the same thing that you didn't know, either an instrumental thing or some physical process in the universe that you were not aware of, the, the supernovae, I don't know, the metallicity dependent, this and that. You thought one thing, it was something else. And it, 
you didn't notice in each individual case, but by the time you are required to average thousands of supernovae, then then it's no longer square root. And in the case of supernovae, we are already for the acceleration of the universe. This is where the problem is. So that's why people, it's all systematic. So that people want to use uh, supernovae in other wave bands, which are a little bit better, less dust, and so on. Anyway, so I think uh, with the um, with the standard candles, uh, the standard sirens, I'm guessing something similar will eventually happen, right? So if we are relying, I'm not so confident that if we are relying on averaging many, many of them, we will not discover that, oh, we didn't know how to calibrate LIGO sufficiently. Well, are you sure? Now it doesn't matter, but if you want a you know, 1% measurement of something, then it's more difficult anyway. Yeah, more questions for Matthias? Any question? Uh, yeah. last, Please ask. I have one last question. Uh, yeah. uh, so you, you mentioned about the non-Gaussianities that CMB has exhausted what it can do. What is the other experiment that you said you're working on that may be able to probe the non-Gaussianity in the foreseeable so, future? Yeah, um, all of, so the, the other experiments are mapping the, the distribution of matter in the late universe. For example, galaxies, surveys of the location of galaxies, uh, where they are, making big maps of them and using those to measure the fluctuations on different physical scales and using seeing if those are gaussian in the late universe not in the and there's uh, many of such experiments uh, trying to um uh you know they get the locations of billion you know millions and millions of galaxies um including many so for example you can one of these there are many of them but one of the one of the ones that um has non-Gaussianity as one of its main targets um, is called Spherex. It's a small satellite that will be launched in a few years. Um, I'm not in particular involved, but I just mentioned that one so you, you can take a look at uh, an example. But uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, ground-based uh, um, telescopes uh, that are going to map vast uh, uh, regions of the universe uh, sometimes uh, with spectra for the galaxies sometimes without like uh, um, lsst um, um, so so that's the, i think most of the information in the coming years in cosmology will come uh, from uh, big surveys of uh, of uh, the location of galaxies. Uh, and those uh, you can use to constrain the Gaussian distribution, but you have to uh, be careful that the system that you are looking at is more complicated than the CMB. So you have to be, you have to be careful. So I think there is a question by Sai Wang. You can ask. Is he there? I think not. So anybody have any question for Matthias? Yeah, you please ask. Anna, you please ask. What the problem? Maybe she types it in. No, I, uh, she raised the hand. That's why I'm asking. Uh -huh. So no question. If there is no question, then I will stop. Last chance. Okay, it seems to, Oof, somebody is again writing. Now you please ask why you are writing here. Please ask the question. 
don't write said you please ask oh acha you just ask just post slides that was a question or post what here is yeah no problem yeah and uh, maybe uh, yeah thanks for nice talk i ask non uh, physics uh, question uh, there was this uh, two blue lines on each slide what yeah i don't know they appeared somehow uh, it I was not special <laughs> no i couldn't get i don't know why they are not in my you know no what happens i don't see them now but when i was uh, okay I, am i yeah. because i was uh, trying to make sense of them they are no, connecting no. something with something are, but then i noticed that it's on each slide. slide there's no i think it's not let, let me just see if i uh, i think it happens because somebody is using a mobile phone and zoom has a, zoom gives server to everyone to override and somebody yeah, somebody called. else uh, you see now they are not there right yeah yeah now somebody uh, when, yeah. when i was sharing the screen maybe somebody um drew something or whatever okay, I see. Share. I see. and then they start <laughs> maybe i should have uh, stopped the sharing and then see, again I sometimes I fi sometimes physicists start to explain something that does not really <laughs> exist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, anybody have any further question, then please ask. Otherwise, I have to stop. Yeah, I think it's over. Okay, so thanks to Matthias for giving such a nice talk and uh, uh, explaining us about the observational cosmology and its constraints. And uh, thank you very much uh, from the QASTM uh, for all members. So, okay, so, thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, so we will post this uh, very soon in archive uh, uh, YouTube, and probably Matthias, you also got an email regarding some uh, uh, special issue. Okay, I will take a look. I didn't uh, look at the email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, please look into that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.